Hello, everyone. Um, we are going to give it a few more minutes before we, we jump into the, the really fun stuff. I would like to see a few more folks come in, but just want to say, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, been informed that it's party central time in the UK, that Christmas parties are in full swing and a lot of folks are wrapping up for the year. So uh, I do know that it's tough to get the time. We're pretty excited to see some of our pals here. Um, look at all those friendly faces coming to say hello. Hi, Simon. Hey, Dennis. <laughs> I love it. Please do not be shy with chat. Jamie and I are compulsive multitaskers, so we will do our best to answer questions, um, to engage. This is yeah. you know, meant to be very conversational, so we do want to hear from everyone. And I love the idea that somebody out there was like, I really don't want to do this Christmas party over Zoom. So, oh, an ethics <laughs> webinar. <laughs> All right. That seems like more fun. Hey, uh, Jake. Dave. All my favorite people. Y'all are wonderful. I appreciate you. This is perfect. Jake, Jamie was talking about you earlier. So this is fantastic. All right. Let's, uh, should we get started? Should we? I don't know. I think, you know, you got your coffee. I still got a pretty full cup. Excellent. All right. Okay. Uh, the first thing that we want to cover is that, um, so with the next slide, Jamie, we're just, Jamie and I talked a lot about this and these are ideas that we have been kicking across uh, probably, I don't know, Jamie, we've gotten fired up conversations about this for literally years. Years, yeah, years. years. And- Like back to the old agency days. Yeah. yeah when Jamie and I first worked together. And the thing is, it's, it's tough to talk about ethics in digital. We get fired up. I am big feelings, Ashley, it happens. Uh, but I think that they're really valuable conversations. And so I want, just wanna set the expectation that we have no answers here. We just wanna start a dialogue. We want to elevate the discussion. We want to share with us or share with all of you the examples that we see that just like get us all riled up. Um, and hoping to hear from everyone, just hoping to start talking about this more and more. I think in general, SEO has matured uh, quite a bit. We've talked about in development, we've talked about a lot of the human elements. So this is kind of like humans are messy. Um, humans so are so messy. And there's never gonna be a really great answer to this, especially, I remember when I first started pitching this idea of talking ethics and search people, like we're marketers, we manipulate people. I'm like, but we should talk about that. <laughs> Do we have to? Are, is there a better way? Um, and for better or worse, I know a lot of SEO folks consider themselves marketers, but a lot of them don't. And we still end up uh, manipulating the SERPs or the information that folks get. So there's uh, there's quite a lot of angles to this. So it's Jamie, the ubiquity. It's the ubiquity of digital marketing, marketing that makes it why we have to talk about this. We are literally tucked in everyone's pocket. And if we don't have a conversation about how we manipulate or at least impact real human lives than we're doing ourselves and humanity mm. a disservice. <laughs> we're, we're dooming it all. Um, and I mean, the, I, I want to plug Jamie's work here because I have a lot of feelings, but Jamie's actually like, she's done the work, the research. Um, there are, we'll, we'll link everything in Twitter, but you've spoken about this. You've written articles. You've been on podcasts about this. So I want to ask you, what is... In your opinion, what's ethical marketing? So I am a humanist and I struggle with being a marketer because this is my own personal definition. It's not a requirement to anybody who's out there, but it's one way of viewing it. And to me, it is, uh, am I treating this person as a human wholly and independently, or am I acting upon them to get a desired outcome? And that makes it really hard for work content marketing. And it's really a, an internal motivator to why I was like, I'm going to go talk to the bots. The bots are a much comfier place for me. What about you? Uh, yeah, computers are definitely less intimidating to me than humans. But it's funny because when you first said, I'm going to go talk to the bots, what I heard is I'm going to go talk to the boss, which has also happened at the same time where we have you know, it's, it's part of like coming to the bots, but I know that you and I have both knocked on doors and been like, excuse me, ma'ams and sirs in charge. Like we want to talk about this and hold ourselves accountable. Uh, so man, 
it's it's you know there's a lot that we can talk about it and it's going to intersect every part of our jobs um jamie and i were trying to think about how the hell do we talk about ethical marketing we settled on a couple frameworks um so we're because it can be a lot of feelings and that's the thing like a lot of times people will go with a gut check and an idea and you know what that's fantastic please embrace your gut your inner biome and guiding force but also how do we scale that out and think about it in a larger framework that is reproducible so we've we've kind of yeah. picked two to talk to there's so many ethical frameworks i'll share this resource from brown that gives great highlights and looking at science and tech and different ways of thinking through it one of the simplest ones that I really love to embrace is Immanuel Kant. And it's just two questions you can ask yourself when you're looking at any action here. Can I rationally suggest everyone do the same as I'm doing right now? And does my action respect the goals of a human rather than treating them as a means to an end? It's two questions, incredibly simple. And I think with the complexity of how we interact with digital spaces and the the gaps between you know an seo with a roadmap plan in a meeting in some remote zoom office to a real life human and how it plays out with them connecting those dots can often be so detached and far away that we don't often think about it so just taking these two steps and going hey does is this something i could apply in this scenario and if not that's okay but now I need to ask myself, what changes would I make? How could I refine, maybe ask better questions? I like this one because it feels, so I, I picked one. <laughs> I picked one that is not my favorite in my heart, but a good counter one, right? Because Ayn Rand, she's kind of a shit, uh, quite frankly, but it's the egoist frame, framework. And this is using calculations. Hey, we use a lot of data, but it's like, what's best for me? Um, and the idea here, the, the one part that I can buy into is that like self-interest goes to self-respect, which then should go to respect for others. I think that's mm -hmm. a far reach for a lot of folks, but this is the other framework that I think about because the calculations part, we've talked about this with accessibility. Because but, you're a secret um, Rand Paul fangirl. Yeah. Obviously. I you just outed know. you to all 100 audience members. <laughs> I'm always out there going, I have conflicted feelings with capitalism, <laughs> but yes, uh, for sure. But it's like, you know, I, I understand like when we talk about accessibility, we'll get into this a little bit more. It's always like, be a good human to others. Fine, get your website going. Uh, fine, make, your, make some money and don't get sued. So we kind of go down this path of framework, even with that to try to appeal to folks. And sometimes it is the calculations of make some money and don't get sued. I don't give a shit if you're a good person because you might not be, but let me push you to do good work in the end. So that's where I see the egos framework. I don't mean to shame you all if you're there because at the end of the day, if we can get to better decisions, I'm pretty good with that. And there are lots of frameworks that can help get us there. Oh, these examples. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about perhaps where we've seen some highly questionable marketing and whomever is out there, someone in chat was just like, hey, don't use shame-based marketing. And I personally love when it's like, no, I don't want to save money and I hate puppies and Janet, please come back to me. Oh my God, my heart will be alone forever to exit an intrusive interstitial. Shame-based yeah. marketing sucks. But there've been uh, a lot more clever ways than just like a basic negging. And one of my favorite examples is Dr. Bukaki. Dr. Bukaki was a world-renowned <clears throat> dermatologist who built up backlinks <laughs> everywhere across medical institutions. Uh, there were like cancer research funds that were linking to this, this renowned dermatologist. And then they flipped the switch and suddenly Dr. Bukaki links went to exactly where you think a Dr. Bukaki link would go. Um, and this was highly successful link building for the individual behind it. And uh, egg on the face of every prominent institution that linked them yeah oh my god 40 new things and and please don't do a search on your work computer at least use uh incognito mode which you should use anyway but actually use the archive way, way back machine that's that's the best way uh yeah i uh i put on here political false information because um politics around me up and are something i care about a lot and all the stuff that went down with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, stuff like that. I mean, it is, it's there, there are studies that essentially say when subjects stopped using Facebook for one month, 
and were surveyed later, all of the ends of extremism came in and people yeah. became more centrist and were talking together one month. And so to me, this brings in the ethics, not only of the campaigns that are running on those, because there are like, and there's a lot, and we can talk about different foreign politics and all of that, but the fact that there are mediums and avenues and platforms do not get to escape responsibility. And so Facebook's though, algorithm, they were exposing more and more. So they were trying to, you know, sway people one way or the other. And actually Brookings Institute released a good study on it. It'll be included in our, um, in our resources that'll be shared on the end on Twitter, everywhere else, because we love citations. You're going to get a ton of them, but essentially, I mean, page papers have been published as early as 2009 on social and swaying opinions from marketing campaigns and what responsibility we have to present neutral, um, this goes with news, but I'm trying to think like neutral and accurate information, who checks the marketers, which is leads to a very messed up case that you had three that I did not know about that stressed me out, the diatees one. The diatees I love. Real quick though, I just want to, I want to highlight that Facebook as an algorithm, they went, we want user engagement. And without checking how users became engaged and knowing, ah, highly emotive incendiary content is what gets people to interact, interact more. Like it had a very simple KPI, user interactions, probably many of you have those as well. But without checking the human aspect behind how that code element was achieved, that's how we get the radicalization. And people, especially in the last two years, our entire worlds have been a lot of digital communities. And when it's in somewhere that's such an echo chamber, so volatile in order to get engagement interaction, like we need to check the KPIs we're measuring success with and the human impact of how they're achieved. Good example of this. I don't know if anybody's been on Instagram and ever been advertised a skinny tea, a diet tea. There was one that I woke up one day and every influencer had it. and you know, there's nudging from real life humans like, oh, I should try this out. Well, it turns out this diet tea on Instagram was actually a laxative. Not only was it a laxative, it was an industrial strength laxative to the point where individuals consuming birth control via pill were not able to absorb it. So unfortunate real life humans ended up conceiving it becoming pregnant because of an influencer based diet tea how insane is this world we live in this is real yes this is absolutely a serious colon cleanse to make room in the womb so to speak <laughs> i mean it makes you wonder who is <laughs> david says he needs some of that sir you are probably the safer audience but as a 38 year old woman like i get diet stuff all the time uh, and it's, it's pretty constant. Jamie and I talk, we'd like to do a future session too, specific on like Instagram and the presentation of the self yeah. and how that affects stuff. I have Snapchat kids. dysmorphia is very real looking at in the UK, you've got a label when you've manipulated photos, um, and how that impacts our sense of self, even the, the F stop on your camera, on your phone changes your perception of what your face looks like, because the focal length of it is known to like make the uh, nose larger and the eyes smaller. So it changes how we perceive ourselves. Yeah, this is a future topic. If anyone out there wants to join in these conversations, our goal is this is the first of a human first series and we're gonna continue having these conversations and learning better and maybe not having answers, but asking better questions. So when we're in these digital spaces, when we're representing ourselves, our businesses, other humans, what are our ethical responsibilities here? Yeah, uh, I had a good question. So in Q&A, Anna asked a good question, which was, uh, do they actually matter in digital marketing and under company pressure? Like you have KPIs you have to hit like to finish tasks. Um, and I did want to say that like, Jamie, you and I have a lot of privilege. Um, we Absolutely. work for a company. So we work for Deep Crawl where we have folks that'll humor us at minimum and let us, you know, take large stomping steps around the room and talk about some of this stuff and push ourselves to do better. Um, we have platforms, mine's a bit smaller, but where I can get ranty about this and not worry about losing my job. Uh, but it is, I think that there are ways that you can start pushing on it that 
accommodate some of these responsibilities and sort of get to this side. So accessibility is a really big one for me. I talk about this a lot. Um, and it's not just, you know, in SEO, we've always talked about folks with site issues being able to see the content, but equal access to information can include a lot of different accessibility challenges, as well as just giving folks access to the content. So whether that is access to platforms where they are publishing content, fact-checking content. Um, if they are, one thing I think about with tech SEO, like if anything's gated, things can be rendered with JavaScript, um, things that work with screen readers, things that are heavy on the data side because not everyone has access to A, high-speed internet or B, cheap data. So there are ways where you can start thinking about the equal access to information and the ethical responsibilities there in a very SEO and tech SEO way. I like to use that as a as a like baby wedge to, to yeah. conversations. Baby steps to get into there. Uh, Google's actually doing an initiative right now where they are translating in uh, 10 new languages. So you can add in a snippet if you wanna have them not translate it. It's basically the same as Google Translate in terms of what the syntax is gonna look like and the accuracy. So it's gonna be some interesting botched translations in there. But 54% of the internet, I think it was 2018, is in English, despite representing a much smaller portion of the population. I believe it's in like 24 to 29. So we have an internet that we've created and curated much like our, our social media feeds that doesn't represent real humans. And if we don't have content available to folks in their languages, or if we have content where it's UGC, users are allowed to get out there and add their content, but there's not moderation or even the rules of that community, of that platform translated in the local language, that it's a bad time, may I cite anywhere now where Facebook is being sued, because actually they just had a, a landmark $150 billion lawsuit put against them by uh, the Ruganese refugees from Myanmar. And when this started, when violence was being incited on that platform in 2016, they had two moderators who spoke Burmese. They now, you know, go, we have a hundred. It's also been five years and it's also been 25,000 people killed and it's been over a million evacuated, fled from their homes. The world's largest refugee camp can be directly tracked to Facebook. That is the power that our actions as creators, as technical consultants in the digital space has. I think about Twitter with the Arab Spring as well, just what they had to have access and to advertise that access. People um, were graffitiing uh, IP addresses to get around government firewalls during the Arab Spring. That's amazing. <laughs> That is pretty incredible. Um, you like that. So, I mean, the last question on that was moral, like, yeah, accessibility legal, but like, this is the question, like, holy shit, what, what responsibility do we have? And like, Simon just asked a question similar to Ani, which is like, uh, how do we do this when we just need to work for a company and pay our own bills? Um, where there is this very much like get in line or get out sort of mentality. I want to get your take on that before we fill out this slide, just because this is now a double question and it's like, it's a really yeah. tough one. So I would point to Google's large shift on their publisher's documentation. They actually just made this cheat sheet, quote unquote, about UGC. So Google has seen what Facebook is about to go through. Facebook for a long time has coasted on being, having the power of the revenue of a publisher, but the privilege and the lack of accountability provided by a platform. Yeah. Google is seeing that's going to close in. So we have this really handy dandy cheat sheet coming out. We also have a migration of a number of their products for publishers that is being consolidated down into a new hub. And my prediction is we're about to see much more uh, stringent requirements for publishers, particularly regarding UGC. So if you can't bring up that conversation from the human first aspect, you can bring it up from the cover our asses aspect of this is coming. Yeah. What are your thoughts there? The 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 like privilege of a platform without responsibility to thing is like, I think what fires me up the most. Um, and I feel like that's almost what we have in terms of Google. Right, so because Google is a platform as well and they don't really, I mean, we know this, we've seen shitty things with, you know, 
I don't know, Holocaust deniers and stuff like that getting ranked very highly. And it's like, what responsibility do you have? Um, the US government says that like 90% of mobile searches and 95% desktop searches are coming through Google. So we rely on them, we trust them. Um, you know, go ask somebody, hey, what was the name of that guy in that movie? And they're gonna pull out their phone and search for it. Here's the thing though, when we assume that the search engine just has the answers, we forget the fact that it doesn't have the objective answers. There's humans like you and I, who our job is to manipulate the answers they see. There's fallible moments here, like the average memory span for a normal adult is seven, which actually, you know what? Maybe that is correct. The pandemic has <laughs> maybe brought me down to five. My like, memory span is now five. <laughs> who's been watching me work day to day? Like seven, that's it. Seven what? Nobody knows. Um, this is a great report from Path Interactive on based on Google, I found important information on a lot of aspects of my life and things I trust and things I need to have guidance I have faith in. And, you know, Google doesn't crawl your site to be altruistic. They want something out of it. They want something they can return to a user and the user will have a sense of trust into it. It's where their money is, but it comes down to is code ethical? It's just some HTML. Like, does it have feelings that are responsible for individuals or how they interact with the world? Um, I, yeah, mixed feelings and about this one. What is good? Like, I want to give you a good answer. Well, good is very relative. Good, you know, varies from human to human. And sometimes we get to see the results of this in SERP. So this is a uh, rich result for the query, people who did good things. And this result right here from Biography Online is about 100 people who changed the world. And this is the problem, is the word good. And so I found this in SERP, uh, I escalated it out and got a response from Danny Sullivan. And he said, you submitted the snippet for review you know, play, the page clearly has good people listed. We may decide yada, 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 but that's not the point. The point is the word good and how we're presenting it. And I don't know where the, I, I honestly, I don't know where the responsibility lies in some ways because, you know, it's, do I want the information index in a way? Yeah. So is the responsibility Google's to either suppress it, not give it rich results, to be more critical of certain topics. Um, we know they have before in the past, or is a responsibility on these websites? And what can we do to, I don't know, push a little harder on those? Like in Germany, they have some really strict laws on hate speech, Nazi propaganda, even laws against Holocaust denial. So they have a structure where they're trying to change the folks on those sites and pushing information. So it's like, I don't know if Google does that or is the main thing to index the world's information and make it accessible. I don't know if there are other ways to pressure websites from some well, of the- Well, from a PR aspect, does Google want to be known as the moral moderator? Or is it more appealing yeah. them just to have everyone involved? And this is also where we look at personalization. So there may be persons out there who truly felt that SERP was accurate. How do we handle that? I don't know. I mean, it's it's tricky because I think of like the the GDPR stuff, right to forget, things like that. Like that can definitely that's good for individuals who want to control it. But these are these are whole philosophies. Um, these are whole examples. This is what, you know, if, if we could get the anarchist cookbook off the internet pretty quickly, <laughs> why can't we get this stuff off? Um I'm gonna counter that point and say quickly. you'll never get the anarchist cookbook off the internet. <laughs> no, we know where it is now. But do you remember that large campaign in like 1999 about it? Oh my God, it was my favorite. Every every mother's nightmare, kids downloading and printing from their home printer. Uh, I remember being in college and a, a boy who had a crush on me brought me a copy of the Anna Chris cookbook. And I was like, that's honestly really cool, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> you type, Jamie, you're a type. <laughs> I have an anarchistic type. Oh my um, God. Okay, so this, this example, <laughs> pisses me off to all end walk me tell me about this you know, tell me, me what you see here this? tell me what you see here uh, all i see okay. is a simple one-line robots directive so 
Yes. In a, like when I first see, I'm like, cool, 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 cool. You don't want this in the index. Fine. I get it. I maybe even endorse it like on first blush, like stuff that maybe shouldn't be indexed, but should be accessed in different ways. I mean, we use it a lot in our daily jobs, but then I, I take a bit of a look and I'm like, TurboTax, use TurboTax, FR. Hmm. Where are and we going? This, this is a fun example because the intent of this no index uh, was for a bait and switch. So for those not familiar, TurboTax here in the US is one of the most common ways that users can file their federal taxes. And if you make below a certain income cap, you're eligible to file for free. There are two TurboTax products. They both have free in the name. It's very hard to disambiguate which one you want. It's particularly hard when the one that you want is hidden from search engine results. And that's exactly what happened here. So Politico did a great piece on this one. Uh, on calling out, hey, they actually took millions of users who could have filed absolutely for free with no money paid and sent them through this pipeline where they're actually paying 50, 75, $125 or more. Yeah. And that is like the IRS. Oh, sorry, ProPublica. Them. Thank you. Yeah. No, I just wanted to include the article. Um, the IRS pushed them. They had a responsibility to work with some of these third parties, similar to what we do with a lot of infrastructure, right, in the U.S., but they're like, obviously, we can't scale this way. We want you to provide a service that can be free to folks, and TurboTax is like, you got it, man. We love this. Like, sure, thank you for partnering with us, and then there was no oversight, um, so this is what the person things. doing their job was like, oh, I need to get more conversions in the paid funnel. This is absolutely. really easy and absolutely worked. It 100% worked. Yeah, but where they, do your KPIs sit with the human impact of low income individuals who are already struggling financially now paying $100 to file taxes when they're eligible for free and the oversight at a higher level, not just for that marketer, for that SEO, but in the company and higher with the accountability to the government because TurboTax has a partnership with the government to make free filing easier. Yeah. And then they instead they hide it. So this is a good one. Like Simon and I asked, like, what do you do when your metric is just like conversions? Like, how can we even like, so this, this goes into this well, like, how can we even change our thinking around this? I mean, I heavily think, capitalistic motivated, like how, how can we help influence that? Well, when we see a blind spot, so a, you're, you're in a team like TurboTax and you see this going to be highly effective bait and switch go out or any other problematic bias or blind spot, how do we respond? How do we escalate that and go, hi, I have a concern <laughs> in a meaningful way. I mean, I wanna start here and talking about this with looking inside Google itself. So a lot of times uh, Google is great for fear tactics to get people to move into the right ways. Um, sometimes they're own actions don't seem to match what they're preaching. Because again, everybody wants that good PR. Uh, there was a fantastic AI ethicist at Google, lead of one of the teams named Timit Gebru. And she spoke out against AI being used for facial recognition. This was when we had the Freddie Gray protests going on. And Local law enforcement was identifying folks and then finding their social media. If individuals had warrants or anything else out for them, then going and basically following them. And it was a very disturbing pattern of behavior. One of the reasons this is so disturbing is because code inherits the bias of those who make it. Yeah. And most AI facial recognition models, if you show it white faces, particularly white male faces, it can identify them very, very accurately. White female faces, less. The darker the melanin of someone's skin, the less likely the AI is to accurately identify them because these models were trained primarily on white male faces. So not only is this an issue of identifying folks who are at a peaceful protest for potential retaliation, but also identifying them using artificial intelligence, machine learning models that were not trained outside of white men. I don't know if you were at the protests, there were plenty of folks there who may have fit that, but the ones that were being targeted, the one that Tim that spoke out against were not. And when she spoke out the next day, 
there was a company-wide email about her resignation. Yeah. She did not know she had resigned. She uh, was told to only speak good of their AI. And in the personal ethical choice to speak out, resigned. Yeah, uh, that ended ugly and I'm glad she didn't stop speaking out. I mean, this is, so I'm making some assumptions here, but the fact that they were targeting and using police profiling more aggressively with the same people that were less likely to be properly identified. And the assumption here is that based on all the protests I went to, are much more likely to make up a greater percentage of the protesters is like a triple whammy, like yes. disgusting kind of scenario there. Like it's super even here in Colorado, uh, who was it? CU Fort Collins was using AI to recognize students when they logged in for classes and a bunch of students of color couldn't log in because their faces weren't recognized. Which then, so yeah. Even waving the flag there and going, hi, um, I see a blind spot and a bias. I mean, the truth is people use AI and machine learning as sort of these catch-alls thinking about wicked smart robots. Uh, it's magic. Them. Humans are writing them. The people predominantly writing this way or writing this code in the most accessible way and widely distributed are white guys in the US. Like it's just, I don't know. And, and they don't, make up the majority of the population even if you're just looking at gender there are more women in this world than men and by far more men writing this code that affects 95 percent of the population so in that case there's like this ethical dilemma that's incredibly passive they may not even know like they may think they're act acting ethically like i think about uh like nlp and natural language processing um, and translating as is a good thing in a lot of ways, right? Like we're bringing information to more people worldwide. So they may be thinking I'm doing great things, uh, but then it opens up this can of worms. It's like this, it could be very actively unethical. Don't get me wrong there. But I think it's one of those things that even just being able to check and understand how we're building stuff, how we're rolling out and what those people actually look like uh, dramatically affects how it's gonna interact with people in the world. And it's really- And that's a great point. It brings us back to the need of a framework. I need to go, can I consistently apply this? Can I have discourse meaningfully, have conversation, accept criticism, refine how I'm thinking? Because if we're just doing that individual gut check that says, I'm gonna make AI that makes, you know, recognizing, picking out who someone is in photos easier, your gut check may go, there's great ways I can do this. It'll be used for wonderful things. Um, yes, it can be used for wonderful things and truly awful things, uh, which is, I guess, I mean, we work for a company, we talk a lot about DEI and accountability, and we're definitely not perfect and have a lot of room to grow, but like, our CEO has not yet fired me for all of the rebel <laughs> rousing, and I appreciate <laughs> that, um, but it's important because sometimes when you want to have these conversations about ethics, you are throwing stones in your own glass house. And again, platform privilege, I'm gonna be okay. I, I know me, I speak loud and I ask questions um, and it's a privilege to be able to do that. But how do you encourage in your own glass house while minding the fact that you are a human who needs the roof above your head, food, all these other necessities and you're gaining this by KPIs that are set. How do we challenge company culture to behave in an ethical way Oh my God, it is, it is throwing rocks in a glass house and the glass house relies on its integrity to, in order for me to get paid. Um, I feel like I play with fire a little bit there. You know, I'm, I'm the breadwinner for my home. I support a family, so it can get a little scary <laughs> when Ashley gets a little bit ranty. Uh, thank you, Deep Crawl, for continuing to allow me to work here uh, and have- There's humility that comes with acknowledging that, you know, <laughs> yeah. we want to have yeah, these conversations. Like it's like an ocean sometimes. Yeah. But I mean, I, so the framework I talked about earlier was the egoist one. Like, let's just like talk about how it can benefit me. And so one way I try to start some of these conversations, because we know that like, if we have different folks working on stuff, we inherently will start having less bias because we're going to have broader conversations. Um, I like well, to talk spots about- too. 
less blind spots. I like to talk about some of the studies that are like, hey man, diverse leadership equals more money for you, longevity in the company. Like I'll just start with that. I'll start with the money thing too. Just start having those conversations, but they're hard. Um, Jamie, you are recognized as like a rightfully like kind of squeaky wheel here. We all, I think most of the team is. Our, our team in particular is, is known for opinions, good work and opinions. Um, but how do but I believe you, you can have them when they're well thought out, when they're compassion based, when they're, I see the goal in trying to execute this plan is X, Y, and Z. These make sense to me. So instead of going ahead and trying like an ad hominem attack or whatever it may be, um, pivoting and looking and going, but there's also this gap over here. And if we foundationally ignore this gap, then we have a problem where we cannot scale and we have a disconnection internally. I think much like uh, machine learning models or AI, uh, when you have diversity in training them, they have fewer blind spots. It's like security. When you have diversity in your security teams and how they test, mm -hmm. you're less likely to have vulnerabilities because it's people who write the code also do security testing on the code. They can't see what they can't see. So encouraging new perspectives. And even if you can't bring that in-house because you're a one-man show, you don't have that place where you potentially challenge someone bringing that paycheck, what you can do is engage in meaningful communities in SEO, yeah. in digital marketing, in whatever, realm you are helping represent humans, companies, corporations, any of it. So Women in Tech SEO is a fantastic group that I really love being a part of. Uh, there'll be a link here at the end is from a podcast I did with them talking about disinformation. If you can yeah. be involved in a community, in addition to company, you have a way of perhaps not tackling a problem head on when it seems like there's no easy answers, but a way of asking a better question about the problem. The community thing I think is, so I got my start in SEO in a community, um, in a, like when Google first started doing help forums. Uh, and the first one was just XML sitemaps. And that was kind of fun. And Mueller wasn't a Google employee, but a regular forum troll like the rest of us. Um, a helpful one at that, but there's You're my so favorite much... troll. <laughs> there's so much <laughs> Mahab Goblin. Uh, there's so much good to be found in that community, but then I'm also finding myself like, yeah, I preach like getting more folks in there and having more voices and more diversity, but I get kind of pissed when people are like, can we get your take on this as a woman? Like, what's your take on 2022 bloody blah SEO, which I don't even love that acronym. Um, so I'm like, great. I'm glad you're reaching out to the community, but also thank you for making it known that you're only reaching out to me, uh, because I identify as a woman and also you're not paying me for my opinion. And this shit takes time and this shit takes resource. Like I am going to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to throw a company here under the bus a little bit, but like the amount of research that goes into search engine journal articles yeah. And that they don't compensate the people that write these articles is fucking insane to me. Like, yes, I love the platform. I love that they're reaching out. I love that I can find Jamie's articles and Ruth's articles and all these people who I love, but that's another situation where you're given a way to have this. And I appreciate that, but they're also getting it for free and gaining a lot of advertising dollars. Like deep crawl lets us run amok, but at least they pay us. Yeah. There is a particular SEO, um, SEM conference that, hey guys, we rarely ever get paid. This is not a thing. <laughs> this is, this is, you do it yourself, you show up, it's a whole deal. And I'm okay with that. I typically ask for comp tickets to give to communities who wouldn't be able to attend. This is my small way of going, okay, I'm not getting paid. You're taking money from folks. Let's get people involved in the conversation who wouldn't normally be able to attend um, this particular large circuit when I asked for that said no we can't do that and their business model is to take people who want the attention the accolades the stage and spotlight and sell them to other people who want to learn and that's okay no shame to their business model but for me when we talk about our ethics here that was me going this isn't for me I'm not going to shame you I'm not going to say what you're doing is wrong to say I'm gonna choose not to give my energy here because there are other events, communities I can interact with and help 
elevate other people rather than playing into a little bit of, you know, bread and circuses. That stuff takes so much time too. I know for my team, I work pretty hard to give folks like 10 to 20% of their time potentially to marketing stuff and getting their name out there. But dude, that's not easy work. And a lot of people that are doing this stuff, y'all are doing it in your own personal time while maintaining a job. And that is crazy, insane. Like that is really impressive. And we already know most of the people aren't going to pay any SEOs for speaking, which is bullshit on its own accord. But I do like the idea of you going out and saying, well, let me give, let, let me find a way to give tickets to folks who deserve it that and want to learn that may not be able to pay for it. I think that's a good way of like starting down that step and at least getting them thinking about it. I mean, there's brilliant folks who will never write an article, never step up on stage and, you know, even be isolated in their own bubbles. So focusing on that when you can't have just company, just corporate culture, you also go to community and you interact with them. Yeah. Because a lot of times, I don't know, when I first started as an SEO, I maintained they gave me my first hire so that I didn't die like a lonely canary. Because it's so esoteric. It's so deep down rabbit holes. You're like, am I, am I having an epiphany right now? Or have I had a stroke and this is word salad and no one's <laughs> going to figure it out for several days? Hmm. I, I think I'm smart. And then I'm like, did I take my medication? Like, like no joke. I take mental health medication and sometimes I get a little manic and get a little wild. And so it's like, Okay, if I'm working on my own, like I'm in an echo chamber, like someone fact check me and let me know where I am. You're in uh, your own personalized SERP <laughs> in your head. God, um, what chaos, um, what absolute chaos is. But I think the goal mind. is here, we have to talk to other people and get other perspectives and promote this conversation of, you know, ethics in more, uh, and a long time ago when humans were like, we're going to band together so we don't get eaten by a tiger. Those ethics were a social contract that say, uh, here's how we're going to live together and avoid conflict and also not get eaten by a tiger. And now we've moved from having that very basic food, shelter, safety needs that are met for folks who are in this space. If you're in tech, you at least have Wi-Fi, you know, you have access to a lot more resources than many other folks do. Well, now that we've shifted from those uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs in the physical space, what does that new need hierarchy and behavior expectation look like in digital space? And there's never an answer. If someone gives you a blanket answer, hear me out, never trust a blanket answer. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your favorite, what's your favorite slash least favorite blanket answer? Like, what, it depends. What it depends. <laughs> How many times a day do I, well, I do say that, but I guess if it's not followed up. It oh, I'm guilty happen. because it absolutely depends. And then we've yeah. come to uh, relative ethics. So the, uh, the ethical value of a situation is based relatively to X, Y, and Z factors. Well, how can you reproduce that at scale? This is where we start having better conversations. So if you are out there and you want to join in on this, if you have perspective I'm a tech SEO. I'm not a robot, but I speak bot. Uh, if you have perspective of, you know, social media, of paid marketing, of RSS, they're trying to bring RSS back hard. Let us know. We want to have these conversations with you. We want to keep this going. Yeah, I did. Um, I had it on the slides before, so three fresh, but I'll share it with everyone. But I have a, mm. we created a little, we created a little form for anyone that wants to play. Mm. Um, it doesn't have to just be us. Where'd it go? Where'd you take it? Where'd you'd you kill to, it? You'd have to refresh, man. I did it. Oh, I you're the worst. Talking. I was captivated. Uh, but, okay, I'm bringing up, I, I know we're at time, but I do want to bring up one more because um, this is something that Jamie and I care a lot about and has some very real like life threatening type of implications uh, is safety for women. And one thing, you know, there was, um, there was a bit of contention two years ago with there being a slide in a conference of a guy hitting a woman, the silhouette of that. Um, and Jamie pointed out one from DiGiorno that, uh, I was not aware of. So, oh yeah. Hashtag why I stayed. So social media has been used to collect, um, to connect a lot of people in this me too era who have their stories, who felt shamed you know, no, I kick puppies and don't want to make $5 billion, but 
more in the interpersonal space. And there was this hashtag trending called why I stayed. And it was people sharing their stories of domestic violence and what led them to endure it. And sometimes brands hop in like DiGiorno did because he had poor cheese crust. Hashtag why I stay. So if you don't want to have a conversation about ethics in your company, be aware that you might find yourself having a conversation about ethics in your company. <laughs> Just Google shit. Dr. Bukaki should have never had that many links to it. Um, <laughs> Just, uh, I mean, it all comes back to like where I feel like I'm like advocating for and against things at the exact same time. But yes, you should be aware. Um, and the more and more statistics you look up, I mean, there there's going to be a lot here, but look up specifically in violence against women. It's pretty scary. Uh, there are specific like hand signals and stuff folks will use in social. For example, I feel like that is very, very important to be aware of because at minimum, I would like people not to abuse that and confuse folks uh, because that actually, I mean, that's just going to dilute everything that we have out there. I mean, sometimes there is good dilution, like the, the proud boys hashtag that was taken over. Thank um, you, George Takei. <laughs> <laughs> yes. By the drag community versus like the neo-Nazi extremist community, but there are also ones where um, hashtags being taken over, uh, is actually really dangerous and takes away a powerful tool. So it's like Jamie and I, like, that's what we talked about. We're like, why are we doing this? Besides the fact that we like to talk about this all the time. Uh, we don't have answers. We know that admit that regularly, but just to have the discussion. So that forum has been linked in chat too. Jamie and I will blast out a ton of resources. Jamie has a really good slide here on all the different places where she has published work. Um, but the main thing is it doesn't have to just be us. I would love folks to join us and talk about us or give us resources that we're missing. Uh, I'd like to hear feedback. Usually there's a, a survey after the thing, which I think there should be, but let us know if you wanna talk about this stuff more with us. We care a lot and maybe we don't have all the answers, but maybe we'll come up with a few good answers or a few good tips that we can all start taking even when, you know, financial stability is a most concern. And I know you're incredibly restricted on what you can do. Maybe we can find a little ways to start chipping away at that boulder. We want your feedback, your thoughts, your opinions, what you liked, what you wanted to talk about, your counterpoints, counter arguments, bring them. This is hopefully the first in many like webinar events we're going to have for human first. So thank you for being humans with us today, for gifting us your time. We appreciate you. We're thankful for you being here and wanting to have these awkward conversations. <laughs> and y'all, we pretty much survived 2021. So can I want your bad self? Take some time off. Uh, remember that paid time off is part of your compensation package and you should be taking it. Um, and uh, please don't be a stranger. Jamie and I are on Twitter. And yeah, that's it. All right, we'll wrap here. But thank you, gang. Thank Have you all. Year.